Hunted Part 2 Keeper of the Woods Written by Neoma Finn Derek came to see me a month before my mother died. Although he's my brother's son, Derek is a year older than me, so our relationship was like that of cousins more than aunt and nephew. Growing up in my hometown of Willard Springs, we were close, but he graduated high school and spent a year away at college before realizing that an advanced education wasn't for him. He came home at the end of the spring semester and began working on my father's farm in time to wish me a fond farewell as I packed up my international scout and moved to St. Louis, Missouri. I don't really know why I chose St. Louis. Chicago would have been a more logical place, given our location. Minneapolis would have made sense as well. I think I felt like they were not far enough removed from Willard Springs. Big cities like New York and L.A. were too far removed. St. Louis felt right, and here I've lived for the past 40 years. At the time of Derek's visit, I had been home exactly once. That was when my grandfather died. I was blessed to have good and loving parents and a large, closely-knit family, but my universe centered around Granddaddy. I followed him wherever he went and mimicked his every move and did my best to model myself after him. My name is Eulalie Jane, after my granny who died before I was born. But it was my Granddaddy who gave me the nickname Shadow. It was a surprise to hear Derek's voice over the intercom that morning. When I heard the door buzzer, I assumed one of my fellow tenants had accidentally locked him or herself out and was looking for someone to open the door for them. Good Lord, Derek, what are you doing all the way down here in St. Louis? I cried as he swept me up in a big bear hug that pulled me off my feet. I had business down here, so I thought I'd stop in. He lied. Business? Yeah, right. What business could a dairy farmer have 400 miles from home? I chided. Well, maybe I just wanted to see my favorite aunt, he offered, as he followed me across the little entry hall into the living room of my apartment. I lived in an old building complete with all the character and charm of arched doorways and French doors and old-fashioned phone niches and outdated electricity, plumbing, and ventilation systems, but it suited me. After all these years, feeling a bit melancholy, I said. Oh, I don't know. He put a little too much effort into his nonchalance. I felt a tinge of suspicion creep over me, but I let it pass and offered him coffee. When I came back in with his cup, my two cats had taken up residence on the sofa beside him. One was glaring at him suspiciously as if demanding an explanation for his presence while the other was busy batting at his hand in an effort to force him to pet her. Are they planning on eating me here, or do they have a den somewhere that they'll drag me off to, he asked as I handed him his coffee. Calope, Calypso, get down, I scolded. Well, they ignored me. Sorry, they're my watch cats. They like to play good cop, bad cop. Calope there distracts visitors with her overly friendly attitude while Calypso works out a strategy for immediate expulsion if the need arises. I don't think I've ever seen such large cats in my life. Derek stroked Calope's back and gave an oof when she jumped out onto his lap. Wow, she's heavy, he said. They're ragdolls, I explained. They're not the largest breed of cats, but close to it. I think Maine Coons are bigger and maybe one or two other breeds. They're actually the friendliest breed I know of. Most ragdolls think they're dogs. Well, I sat down in my favorite oversized chair next to the little gas fireplace and opened my arms for Calypso to jump into my lap. And with both of us now securely pinned to our seats by 20 pounds of overly affectionate fur, I asked again why Derek had come so far for a visit. Well, you know, Grandma isn't well, he began, after a moment of consideration as to how to proceed. His statement left me feeling cold inside, and I responded accordingly. Yeah, Derek, I know. Just because I never go back there doesn't mean I don't keep in touch. I talk to Mom and Dad at least two or three times a week, and they come here a lot. Especially since you boys have taken over the dairy business. 
A lot of the city people don't realize that farming is a business the same as manufacturing. Over the years, my family has gone a bit further than selling milk to companies who package it under their own names. Parker O'Connor is its own label. However, I left that world when I was 18. My knowledge of dairy farming is rudimentary at best, and my memories of growing up on the farm feature creeks on hot summer days and my mother's vegetable garden and the elusive blue ribbons offered at the county fair and snow-covered hills and hollers through which snowmobiles were driven. But nevertheless, I'm proud of my family, even if I don't fully understand their passion for milk production. Sitting across from Derek now, I was painfully aware that he wasn't here to talk butter fat and protein content of milk with me. There were questions in his eyes for which I was sure I had the answers, but that I wasn't entirely sure I could provide. I wasn't accusing you of anything, he said calmly. I was just saying that she isn't well. He softened his voice even more and continued. I know you love Grandma and Grandpa. You've been a good daughter to them, even from so far away. They brag on you all the time. Grandpa never fails to mention how you came home from Granddaddy's funeral and enrolled yourself full-time in college and you worked hard at it. He gave me a crooked smile before saying, and we all know how hard you had to work. School was never your forte. Well, shut up. I laughed, relaxing a bit. Grandma and Grandpa are proud of you, he said. Who would have ever have thought anyone in our family would go so far that they'd actually become a professor at a university? He said this with an easy grin. Well, I'm not a full professor yet, I corrected. I've only just recently achieved the rank of associate professor, you know. Tomato, tomato. It's still more than anyone expected. Again, he shot me a lazy grin. From you, anyway. I picked up a pen from my side table and I threw it at him. The tension was slithering out of the room. Well, thanks for not berating me about that. And To be honest, I feel guilty not being there. I hope that my smile hid some of the self-loathing I felt for my cowardice. We spent the next half hour making small talk and catching up on the happenings of Willard Springs. It was nice having Derek there. My own brothers were all grown up when I was born. My sisters were, too, and I was closer to him than I ever could have been to my siblings. Suddenly, Derek asked, What happened that week after Granddaddy died? And there it was, a shot in the dark, unexpected and painful. All the tension flooded back in. Well, how much do you know? I countered. I know that I hear things in the woods when I'm working in the barn. I know that whatever's out there howling is too big to be a wolf. I know that calves disappear, and Grandpa blames it on coyotes. And I know we have fewer barn cats in our neck of the woods than on any farms anywhere else. And I know that I don't hunt anymore. You don't hunt? That statement said it all. What have you seen? I asked. He was silent for a moment, debating how much more to say. All right, I have seen something, actually more than once. Did you talk to your grandfather about it? I asked. No, he exclaimed indignantly. I don't want to scare him. I burst into laughter at that, and it left him sputtering nonsensical words until I interrupted with, Your grandfather has known about those things since long before you and I were born. The expression knocked him over with a feather, overused as it may be, was exactly what I was sure I could have done to him at that moment. No, how? You can't be serious, he stammered. I was tempted to go find a feather. How do you know? My story of the house that I'd heard while staying at Granddaddy's house on the night of his funeral and the figure I'd seen lurking around the barns unfolded between deep sighs and long pauses. He pointed out that my father would never have called the sheriff, much less agreed with him, if he already knew what was out there. I suggested that he did that for my mother's sake. She didn't know what my father and grandfather knew, and he would have done anything necessary to keep her from ever finding out. I stood up then and went over to the far wall of my living room where several floor-to-ceiling bookshelves sagged under the weight of too many books. 
and from a lower shelf, I removed one of my grandfather's journals. A few days after I arrived home from his funeral, they were delivered to me with a note that said, For safe keeping, love, Dad. I handed the journal to Derek. He opened it and began reading. January 17, 1956. I heard them howling again last night. I asked Lally this morning if she'd heard anything, but she said no. I think I might get a telescope, one of those spy scopes like a sea captain uses, and put it up in the attic in the west window. Derek stopped reading and I began to laugh. What are you laughing at? He said. I don't know how I did that, I said. There are two dozen journals on that shelf and that's number two or three. I just reached down and grabbed one, but that's the very first one I read too. Well, what are these? He asked, flipping the book over in his hand. What does the DM stand for? I explained how I'd found the journals while cleaning out the office, and Granddaddy had kept a record going all the way back to the middle of 1954 when he first heard the howling. He recorded every date, every sound, every animal taken or missing, and every thought he had about them from July 27, 1954 to September 22, 1975. Most of the entries were no more than a couple of sentences stating things like, I heard them last night, or Bullet is missing, he was a good dog. The more detailed entries were descriptions and behavioral observations. As for the DMs, I can only guess, I concluded. Why did he stop in 1975? Derek asked. I don't know. Maybe there are more notebooks. Maybe he was beginning to see things that scared him too much, I offered. Do you think it had anything to do with Juliana Dennison? Derek wondered aloud. Juliana Dennison? I had to think for a moment. The name sounded familiar, but I couldn't put a face to it. And then it hit me. Oh, you mean Matt's old girlfriend, the one he was engaged to but never married. You know, I liked her. The memory of seeing the two of them skinny dipping in the river that night flooded back to me. Whatever happened to her? Shadow, Derek said harshly, not understanding his sudden anger, and I stared back in shock. Seeing that I was at a loss, he said, Don't you remember? Uncle Matt almost went to jail for her. Well, baffled, I shook my head. Juliana Dennison disappeared one night when she and Matt were on a date. They found her body all tore up. Now how can you forget something that gruesome? It was the biggest news ever to hit Willard Springs and Uncle Matt was damn near charged with killing her. Dear God, I did remember. I remembered seeing them in the water in the moonlight and I remembered them splashing each other and laughing. I remembered them coming together in an embrace and I remember her turning and heading for the shore and disappearing in the woods and screaming. I remembered it all. How could I have forgotten? It was the night I had slipped up to the attic to play with the telescope when I was ten, and somehow I'd managed to block it all out. But now the images came flooding back to me, and I could hear the distant screaming and pleading for mercy. I could see Matt running into the brush and coming out again and yelling for her. And he swept up his jeans and he pulled them on as he ran for his truck and I heard him pull into the barnyard. I heard him running into the house and my dad calling the police, or was it my grandfather? Shadow, shadow, Derek's voice was coming from somewhere far away. I looked up and saw his face inches from mine. His lips were moving and sounds were coming from his mouth, but I couldn't understand them. I felt sick. Suddenly, I pushed Calypso off my lap and shoved Derek away, and I ran down the hall to the bathroom. By the time I was through, I was wishing I'd eaten more that day. It would have been easier than the constant retching. When I finally collapsed onto the bathroom floor, certain I'd never be able to stand up again, I dissolved into loud, ugly sobs. Fifteen minutes later, Derek knocked on the door. Shadow, are you okay? No, I was not okay. I couldn't accept the image of Juliana Dennison except to see a rabbit running across a patch of snow and being swept up by a monster that, until that moment, 
I never could have believed existed. What was worse, a fraction of a second before it sank its teeth into the soft fur, the rabbit turned into Juliana. I pulled myself back to my feet and I opened the door. Derek's worried face loomed over me. His hands came up to support me as I began to sway a bit. Gently, he led me back to my chair in the living room and then disappeared down the hall to return with a glass of water. I took it gratefully and sipped gingerly for several long minutes before I was able to speak again. Derek listened in mortified silence as I described the scene I'd witnessed that night when I was a child. I told him that, as far as I knew, the telescope was still intact. And then I remembered that Dad had interrupted me the night I saw the dog man, and I didn't replace it. If Mom was the one who found it later, it would likely have been tucked back into a little space under the window. But if Dad went back up the stairs that night, he may have gotten rid of it to prevent any more unwanted incidents. We'll see, he said. When I get back, I'll go there first thing and look. Why? I asked. What would you do with that little monocular? It's over 40 years old. You'd be better off buying a new one, a better one. And then I paused and nodded. You'd be better off staying away from the subject altogether. I can't, Derek answered flatly. I understood. I hated it, but I understood. After that, we sat in silence, and Derek spotted a short plastic pole on the coffee table and picked it up to dangle the attached feather and bells over the cat's heads. They danced around and batted at it and then at each other, and my eyes were fixed on the cats, but my mind had me trapped in an attic, staring out a window and seeing something that couldn't be. It could have been an hour before Derek spoke. It could have been two hours. The cats had long since lost interest in the dangled feathers, so I doubt it could have been less. And finally, he stood up. I had been so deep in thought that his movement startled me. Are you leaving? There was an actual fear in my voice for which I was ashamed. Yeah, he said, slipping into the jacket that he draped over the chair earlier. It's getting late. Why don't you stay? I pleaded, much to my self-disgust. I'll come back tomorrow, he promised. How about I come and take you to breakfast? I thought about that for a minute. Tomorrow felt like a long drive across a frozen tundra away, but he was right to leave me. I needed the time to process these new memories, to understand them. Okay, I acquiesced, but not on farm time, I quickly added. I don't get up before 7 a.m. Look at you, lazy bones, he teased. It was still early on Saturday afternoon when Derek left. I felt restless and uncomfortable, so I decided to head over to my office on campus, where I had access to the new tool called the World Wide Web. There I searched for an hour to find all that I could about the death of Juliana Dennison. The internet was still young back then and not nearly as helpful as it is today. And in the end, I relented and walked over to the library where I scanned through microfiche images of old newspapers until I found what I was looking for. The headlines were harsh and accusatory. Local man accused of killing fiancé while swimming read the first. The article relayed the story of how Matt had taken Juliana down to the river to spend some time alone with her and talk about their wedding plans for this following summer. There were several quotes from friends whose names I recognized and who declared Matt's innocence and his inability to commit such a heinous crime. The second paper, with the headline, Woman Attacked and Killed in the Woods, Fiancé Held for Questioning, was more of the same. This time, they interviewed Granddaddy, who adamantly stated that it had to be a wild animal. No man could do to another human being what had been done to that girl's body. I flipped through several more articles, each revealing a little more about the autopsy. The match release based on the autopsy results and a search for large predators in and around the river that ended fruitlessly. The last article declared her death to be a direct result of wild dogs, 
all of which, it said, were rounded up and euthanized. Juliana's obituary showed a face that I barely remembered. They had obviously used a school picture. Her hair was long, dark brown, and parted in the middle with two metal hair bows holding it back from her face on each side. Her pale eyes were heavily made up in the electric shades of blue that were popular at the time, and she was wearing a short-sleeved, light-knit turtleneck. I stared at her with little sympathy. I never liked her. Unlike us, she wasn't a farm kid, and for that, she looked down on us. She lorded her college degree over us as though it was somehow made her better. And my mother always acted awkwardly in front of her, and my dad always found an excuse to work on something out in the barn when she was there. And granddaddy stayed away altogether. Despite this, the thought of her being torn to pieces by one of those creatures living in our woods was disturbing. And I suppose that no one should have to suffer that sort of fate. I had the librarian print out copies of all the articles I found, and I took them home with me. Derek and I had been staring into our cups of rapidly cooling coffee for too long. The din of people talking and dishes being cleared and servers rushing past with plates of food and bacon sizzling on the grill somewhere beyond the lunch counter created miles of distance across a little formica top table at which we sat. Neither of us could think of a thing to say. It seemed impolite to march into the topic that dominated all of our thoughts. But because it was all either of us could think about, it left us incapable of any other conversation. I gave up. Tell me your story. Huh? I wondered if Derek had fallen asleep into his own thoughts that he'd forgotten I was there. Oh yeah, well, he began. With the impeccable timing that only a server can have, ours approached the table at that moment to refill our cups and assure us that our food would be out momentarily. I thanked him with a smile and then turned back to Derek and waited. He took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. His eyes wandered to the window beside us. Rain was falling at a steady pace outside. Derek wasn't fond of rain, but I, on the other hand, am a complete pluviophile. Remember that time we all decided to canoe the St. Croix and we got all the way down to Hinkley before we realized we didn't have a way to get back to our vehicles? It was a diversion, but at least he was talking. And we had to call Grandpa and Granddaddy to drive up and get us. He was laughing now. It sounded nice. And then it started raining before they got there. We had to turn the canoes over and huddle under them for shelter. We should have stayed at the gas station and had them pick us up there, I said, smiling back at him. Or we could have paddled back upstream like I wanted to. And poor Ben. We had to make him wait there with our canoes while we walked to a phone booth. And then we got back and he was throwing a fit about somebody tossing rocks at him. Derek grew silent again as realization dawned across his face. Tell me your story, Derek, I said again. We had to wait in silence for a minute while our server, with his unbearable timing, placed a plate of eggs and bacon and a plate of biscuits and gravy and a plate of pancakes in front of Derek and a bowl of fruit and granola topped with yogurt in front of me. You're going to starve to death eating like that, he chided, and you're going to get old and fat eating like that, I retaliated. It was a familiar banter that helped us both relax. Derek shoved a piece of bacon in his mouth and he grinned. At least I'll get old. And then without further prodding, he began. It's been going on for so long, to be honest, that I can't put a start date on it. I think I've known since high school, maybe earlier, that something wasn't right in our woods. Something isn't right in any of the woods around there. You know how Granddaddy never let us hunt alone in the woods, but used to slip in there when we didn't know? I was sure there must be some trophy buck roaming around in there, and I was just as sure as I was going to be the one to bring it in. And I honestly don't know what I would have said to Granddaddy if I had. There were times in those woods when I seriously felt like I was being stalked. 
and for the longest time I thought it was Granddaddy. I kept expecting him to mention it in the middle of some family dinner, but he never did. And after a while, I convinced myself that it wasn't him, but for the life of me, I couldn't figure out who or what it might have been. It was always the same. I'd be walking and everything would go silent like a predator was close by, and then I'd hear footsteps around me. And I'd stop and look around, but I never could see anything. It was always so damn quiet. No birds, no squirrels, no insects, nothing. And then I'd start walking again and I'd hear footsteps again. Sometimes a stick or a rock would get chucked at me. That was always when I'd get too spooked and I'd walk out. But whatever was out there always walked out with me. But when I'd get to the road, it never came out of the woods with me. Or if I was down the river and once I crossed it, it would stop following. I guess that started all the way back in high school, but I can promise you there are times, even today, when I go into those woods, that I feel something is watching me, something doesn't want me there, and something is chasing me out. Well, you're lucky there, Derek, I said. Those were probably the Sasquatches. He leaned in suddenly and he said, Do you believe in Bigfoot? Well, I thought it was a ridiculous question. Of course I believe in Bigfoot. I've read all of Grandfather's journals and I've had countless conversations with my father about the behavior he'd witnessed and the signs he'd recorded. Although I didn't see a Bigfoot in the woods that cold winter day, what I did see told me that if they can exist, then sure as hell a Bigfoot can. As quickly as he leaned in, Derek withdrew. He didn't wait for my answer. It wasn't a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot that I saw last spring, he said. I was turkey hunting. There was a big tom that I'd been watching. I couldn't believe my luck when I managed to call him in on that first day. God, it was frustrating watching him duck in and out of the brush. I was waiting for a clear shot. He'd step behind the bush and there was sudden movement and feathers went everywhere and the damn thing was gone. It was just gone. Derek's face mirrored his astonishment as his hands came up to wipe the air like a giant eraser. I was so shocked that I think I must have yelled or something, and the next thing I knew I was looking at the crown of a head sticking up from behind the bushes. It kept standing until its eyes were visible. The color drained out of Derek's face at the thought of what he'd seen that day. Those eyes were like two coals of fire staring right into me. He looked at me as if he were waiting for me to argue with him, but how could I when I remembered so well that horrible feeling when a pair of similar eyes pinned me from an impossible distance away? And he continued, and its teeth, its canines were massive. I could see the fear washing over him at the memory. Those bushes had to be at least as tall as me, at least six feet. But when it rose up, I knew it had to be well over that. I was down on the ground looking up, but I could still see its head over the bushes. A Derek was beginning to tremble. His face glistened with sweat as his skin paled to a waxy white, and tears welled up in his eyes. I sat silently while he pulled himself back together, and he took a bite of food and he chewed it with his thoughts. I began to wonder again if he'd forgotten I was there. And then he looked up and abruptly asked, Why did you leave so suddenly after Granddaddy's funeral? Well, that caught me off guard. Something happened, didn't it? I mean, that day, after you heard those howls and after you found the notebooks, after you saw it kill the rabbit, something else happened, didn't it? It was like a strange game of live chess we were playing. The white queen would question and the black knight would withdraw. The black rook would speak and the white bishop would counter. I could almost hear a distant primordial drumbeat keeping time, or maybe it was my heart. Yes, something happened. He held his breath as I told him how my dad had taken me down in the woods to show me the signs of the dogmen and possibly to look for an indication that the Bigfoot were returning. If they were coming back, he'd said, then the dogmen wouldn't be leaving again until late fall. And then we were attacked. Attacked, he cried. You were attacked? 
Uh, yeah, I assured him. We parked his truck on the river and were walking the farm road up to Granddaddy's house when we were suddenly surrounded by them. Well, I marveled at how calm I managed to sound. I wasn't feeling it. Visions of Juliana and the rabbit were racing through my mind, and now they were accompanied by the sounds of grass and dead leaves and crystallized patches of snow being crushed under massive paws. Well, how did you get away? he cried, causing a disapproving stare from some nearby diners. That was one question I wasn't certain how to answer. How did I get away? The better question was who followed me out. My father had insisted that he was never with me, and as soon as he was certain that those creatures weren't going to follow me, he turned the other way. He had chosen to die rather than to let them get me, but I know there was someone or something behind me. I heard footsteps. I heard him breathing. I felt his presence. And yet, I know when I turned around at the door, the barnyard was empty. If it wasn't my father, who could have disappeared like that? If it had been a dog man, would I still be alive to tell the tale? Over the years, I've entertained the idea that it was the ghost of my grandfather seeing me to safety, or perhaps it was a Sasquatch. My father was fond of saying that they had rules. Stay out of their territory and don't interrupt a hunting expedition. Announce your presence when you enter the woods if you think they're around, and if you hear tree knocks or get something thrown at you, walk calmly and deliberately away. Maybe they felt that the dogmen were breaking the rules and their retaliation was to prevent them from turning me into a meal. Dad said they always returned in late winter or early spring. Wait! This time it was me who drew the disapproving stares from the other customers. What? Derek yelled back. People were staring openly now. We must have looked like a couple of Looney Tunes yelling back and forth at each other and jumping at every word. I might have laughed if not for the sudden realization that Derek's story didn't make sense. It didn't follow the rules. Did you say you were turkey hunting? I asked. Yeah, what about it? Spring turkey season. Isn't it in like April? It was the last week in April. Why? Having never read the journals and not realizing that his grandfather was as close to an expert on the subject as a man could be, Derek couldn't have known that by April the dogmen should have been gone or that they shouldn't be coming back until the end of summer. Did it look like a dog? I asked. Well, not exactly. It looked almost like a, I don't know, it was really dog-like. It was more like a mandrel. You know, one of those big monkeys with the weird red nose and white. Did it have ears? I interrupted. What? Uh, I guess so. I don't really remember. They weren't obvious? No, I guess not. Confused by my obsession with ears, Derek finally asked, What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world, I said. Dog men generally look like, well... Dogs. I mean, I've read a few instances where people thought they might look like their hyenas, but for the most part, they have a canine appearance. I thought you were describing a dog man, but it's the wrong time of year, Derek. In all of Granddaddy's journals and everything Dad has told me, the dog men leave the area sometime in late winter or early spring, and they don't come back until the Bigfoot leave at the end of the summer or the beginning of the fall. Juliana was killed in mid-September, right? I pointed out. Well, he nodded. Well, that means the Bigfoot had already moved on. Granddaddy and Dad had a theory that these things are all migratory. They kept records of what they saw and when they saw them. I suspected I was speaking too quickly for Derek to take it all in. Come on, we need to go back to my place. I'm not saying it wasn't dog-like. He was saying as I jumped up and signaled to our waiter. I was already throwing cash on the table when he arrived. Derek shot a mournful glance at his barely touched food and followed me out the door. I was trying not to run the two blocks back to my apartment in the rain. It was uphill all the way and I could hear Derek huffing behind me. Too many biscuit and gravy breakfasts, I muttered. 
Slow down, he yelled, and I ignored him. At my apartment, I had to stop and dig my key out of my pocket, and then I fumbled it and I dropped it, and it bounced off the cement stoop and into the mud. We both had to crawl around on our knees in the shrubs to find it, and fortunately, we were already so wet that it didn't matter. At my apartment door, Derek wrenched the key from my hand and opened it for me with a look of disdain. He wasn't about to let me drop another key. I led the way across the living room to a set of French doors that opened into a small, glassed-in sunroom that I had turned into my office. Fall semester had just begun, and I already had a stack of papers to grade. I pushed them aside and pulled a small chair from the corner over so that Derek could sit beside me, and then I reached into the bottom drawer of my desk and withdrew a large D-ring binder. It was full of notebook paper and sheet covers filled with type pages or diagrams in them and several drawings. Sections were separated by tab sheets, all of which had seen better days. I opened the binder and began to flip through it tab by tab until I reached the section I was looking for. The first page of that section was a heading sheet that read, Descriptions and Depictions. I turned to the second page. It had only one word typed in three-inch tall capital letters, Bigfoot. The next page was a type description copied from my grandfather's journal and below it was another description that my own father had given me via the telephone. The next page listed a variety of descriptions pulled from the books of those brave enough to put into print their belief in a creature assumed to be mythical by the general population. I turned the page again to stare into the first of a dozen or so artist renditions of the big hairy beast. What you saw, I asked Derek, as Calypso jumped into my lap, did it look like any of these? He was already shaking his head before he even began to look. And page by page, he looked at the drawings. And then he shook his head, no. I told you, it wasn't a Bigfoot that I saw. The next page said Dog Man, where the first had said Bigfoot. What about these? I asked, turning the pages with the Dog Man drawings on them. Derek took his time looking through these pictures. Included in them were drawings of werewolves by artists like Frank Frazetta, but I didn't mention that to Derek. He studied each image and shook his head and then turned the page. I skipped over the next several pages. They were all creatures that my father and grandfather believed to exist in the woods and along the riverbanks around the farm, but I highly doubted any of them would be what Derek had seen. They included creatures like Pugwudgies They were easily eliminated by the mere fact that they stood only three feet tall, and ghosts and demons that I dismissed for a variety of reasons. And finally, I got to the last section. It was labeled Unclassified. There, I flipped to the drawing, and Derek drew in his breath. That's it, he cried. That's exactly what I saw. My heart fell into my stomach. Derek had identified a Gugwi. Gugwi, he asked, reading the name under the drawing. What does that mean? It means face eater, I said. And you, my dear nephew, may be the only man ever to have gotten that close to one and lived. Derek lifted several pages of the binder at the top corner and let them slide over his thumb back into place. What is all this? he asked. Dumbfounded, I couldn't answer him. Did he not understand that he had been face to face with something even more terrifying than a dogman? Had he failed to see exactly how close his life had come to being over? His face registered no shock. His manner betrayed no level of concern. He did nothing more than sit there and stare at the pages. I reasoned that perhaps he was emotionally incapable of dealing with the magnitude of the situation, or maybe he'd simply lost his ever-loving mind. Shadow, what are these? His voice brought me back to the moment. I had to gather myself before I could speak. 
and finally I managed to explain the binder. Shortly after I got home from Granddaddy's funeral, Dad sent the journals to me. I've had them for... I stopped and I calculated the time that it passed. Thirteen and a half years, I guess. At first, I kept reading them over and over again. I guess I thought I was going to memorize them, and then I realized the information in them needed to be sorted and categorized. That's when I started making this binder. Well, what are all these other things in here? He asked, flipping back to the pages showing creatures that he'd probably never heard of. At one time or another, either Granddaddy or Dad had seen all of these creatures, and most of them they didn't have a name for. The ones that Dad saw, I was able to work with him to identify. Some only Granddaddy saw, so they're not much more than an educated guess. I actually have this to thank for my livelihood. What? Derek asked. How do you mean? When I came back here, I had resigned myself to a life of bartending and waitressing. Jobs weren't hard to come by and the tips were good, but then those journals arrived. I was so obsessed with them, I spent every minute that I could at the library researching and reading and learning. I was sitting at a coffee house pouring over one of those books when a man approached me and asked if I was enjoying his book. Derek's brow shot up and I laughed. Yeah, he was the author of the book that I was reading. So we got into a deep conversation on the subject, and though I wouldn't tell him why I was so fascinated, he was impressed by how much I knew and suggested that I consider it as a profession. I had no idea people actually made mythological studies a profession, but here I am today. Wow, Derek whispered in amazement. I had no idea. Derek, how did you get away? I asked. The question was burning holes in my brain. If he decided to dance around the subject, I might have picked up that binder and smacked him over the head with it. But instead, he gave me an answer so simple that it didn't make sense. Something tried to steal its food. Okay, we have to stop this whole staring at each other in disbelief nonsense, I said, even as I stared at him in disbelief. Straight talk from here on out, okay? All right, that's a deal, he said. Then explain to me how something tried to steal you, I said. No, no, not me, the turkey. Two seconds and I was already staring in disbelief again. It took that Tom I was after, remember, he said. Oh, oh, of course. The disbelief faded away. Something tried to take it from him. I was sitting there on the ground staring up at that, that, that thing and it was staring down at me, and I knew I was going to die. I can't explain how, but I knew I was going to die. It's like when a person bleeds out, except it wasn't blood being drained from my body. It was hope. It took a step toward me, and I thought, well, this is it. And then I heard this sound like something crashing through the brush, and it turned around, and I heard growls and snarling like nothing I'd ever heard before. Trees were breaking and bodies sounded like they were being thrown around and something in the back of my head screamed at me to run, so I ran. I turned and I ran out of there faster than I've ever run before in my life. I'd parked my truck on the other side of the river, but I didn't wait to get to the rock path to cross it. I splashed into that cold water, gilly poncho and all, and I waded across. I figured I was either going to be torn apart by that thing he jetted his finger at the picture in the binder, or be pulled under by my poncho. Drowning seemed like a better option. Well, thank God I chose a fairly shallow spot to cross. We had a lot of rain last spring. I really could have drowned. I drove out of there like a lunatic, and I haven't been back since. It took all the desire to hunt right out of me. Why did you think it was trying to steal its food? I don't know. It was just the impression I got, he said. Did you see what it was fighting? I asked. Well, Derek thought for a minute and then he said, No, I imagine it was a dogman or a Bigfoot. Bigfoot, maybe, I answered as I flipped through the pages of the binder to a sheet that folded out. 
It was a line graph showing the active seasons for each of the creatures. Dogmen would have been gone by then. Derek ran his finger across the graph, examining the rising and dipping lines and their coordinating dates. He traced the red line indicating dogman activity and then went to the blue line for Bigfoot. And after that, he ran his finger down the left-hand column looking for the word Gugwe. Where's the Gugwe line, he asked when he didn't find it. It's not on there, I told him. They don't have a season. The only way I can tell, based on Granddaddy's notes and what Dad says, the only way to tell if they're in the area is lack of signs from anything else. Even the Bigfoot and Dogman are afraid of these things. And they're not afraid of anything, Derek added. Gunfire, I corrected. You can sometimes chase them away with gunfire. Derek spent the rest of the morning studying the binder and journals. I gave him a notebook so he could take some of his own notes. Once I was sure that church was out and my parents were back home, I excused myself to go feed the cats. From the other room, I called my dad and I told him everything. It came as no surprise that he was angry, but I thought it would be better to tell him over the phone while Derek was 400 miles away from him. It would give him time to calm down before he killed him. That afternoon, Derek headed back to Willard Springs, a wiser man. He promised to call and let me know if he survived his grandfather's fury. Now that my father had a new co-conspirator, one who was on site, I felt a great weight lifted off my heart. I wasn't completely at ease. My mother's health was failing fast. I knew it was a matter of time before I'd have to make the long drive back home. That was Sunday, September 9, 2001. Two days later, the world would change, and all thoughts of Bigfoot, Dogmen, and Gugwe were replaced with the thoughts of terrorism, war, and retribution. I didn't speak to Derek again until October. I went to church on Sunday, October 7, 2001. I've never been a devoted churchgoer. I read my Bible and I pray a lot, but getting up on Sunday morning and putting on a nice dress and then driving halfway across the town to the Baptist church of my choice had always seemed to take a back seat to finishing the stack of papers on my desk that had to be graded. That was before September 11. Sunday, October 7, stands out in my memory for two reasons. That was the day that George W. Bush announced that we had begun military action against Al-Qaeda. It came over the radio as I was driving home after stopping for a bite to eat, and every house I passed was flying an American flag. Grocery stores had American symbolism painted all over the front windows. I had a few students who decided to quit school and join the military. A couple of them eventually came home in caskets draped in those American flags. We were a proud country at that moment. Race, gender, religious beliefs, and most of all, political affiliation were of no importance. Being an American was the order of the day. The only order of the day. My second reason for remembering October 7, 2001 was the phone ringing when I got home. I knew it was my father. I had only recently begun carrying a cell phone and was reluctant to give the number out to anyone. My parents had it, of course, but they were old-fashioned, and I wobbled across the room under the onslaught of two giant balls of fur who seemed intent on tripping me in their need to say hello. I'm here, don't hang up, I cried into the receiver when I finally got to the phone. You need to come home now. Is she? I couldn't bring myself to say the words. She's still with us, but I can't promise she will be for more than another day or so, so hurry. Put her on the phone, Dad. I need to hear her voice. My own voice was shaking now. Oh, baby, she won't. Just do it. Please, Dad. There was a sigh on the other end of the phone and the sound of the receiver being placed on the table. A few minutes later, I heard the extension being picked up in the bedroom and my father's voice in the background saying, 
She's on the phone now. Mom, I said, trying hard not to let her hear my tears. Shadow. I will never forget her voice that day. It was so weak, so unlike my mother's voice. My heart shattered in my chest. I love you, Mom, I choked out. I love you too, Shadow, she whispered. There was a moment of silence. I didn't know what else to say. I was terrified that my father would pull the phone away from her. Even if it was only to hear her breathe, I didn't want to let go. And then she said, I know, baby, I know. Hold on, Mom, I croaked this time. I was completely incapable of stopping the tears. I'm coming home. I know, baby, she repeated. I know. A second later, my dad's voice came back over the receiver. He said, she's asleep now, Shadow. Now hurry home. I'm on my way, Dad. I'll be there as soon as I can. I hung up the phone and called my department head. We knew this was coming, so we already had a plan. I had only to let her know that it was time. An adjunct was prepared to step in and cover my classes for the next two weeks if necessary. Dr. Witherspoon offered her condolences and wished me a safe trip. My next call was to Brad. He owned the bar where I called myself a bartender for the last time before going to work at the college. A single parent with a young daughter, he'd often depended on me to watch her on the nights when I wasn't scheduled. Peyton loved my cats. Whenever I had to go away, I could always depend on Brad and Peyton to come and take care of them for me. And then I went into the bedroom and I packed. An hour later, I had dropped my spare keys at the bar and I was driving north to Willard Springs. The last time I had driven home, it was in my old 1977 International Scout 2. I loved that old truck. She was ugly as hell, but she was mine. She died up there, so I came home in my grandfather's Ford truck. I was determined to take better care of it than I did the Scout, As a result, it lasted right up until the turn of the century when I finally broke down and bought a brand new one, the first brand new vehicle I ever owned for my 36th birthday. Now, as I drove, I struggled with the overwhelming fear. I couldn't let it stop me. I had to get there. I had to see my mom one last time. I arrived at mom and dad's a little before 11 p.m. that night. It hadn't occurred to me that anyone would be awake. Even more surprising, the house was full, and I entered through the front door to see Kate and Jenny in the living room sitting on the sofa together, arms wrapped around each other. My brother Greg was sitting with them in a chair across the room. As I made my way down the center hall to the kitchen, I counted a dozen nieces and nephews, some sitting on the stairs and others gathered in the side parlor, a few sitting around the big oak table in the dining room. Each of them, in turn, raised their heads and nodded to me. At the end of the hall, I entered the kitchen to find my oldest brother, Mike, sitting at the kitchen table nursing a cup of coffee with his wife, Penny, sitting beside him and gently rubbing her hand up and down his back. Matt was there, too, with his head bent. His wife was at the sink washing dishes. Derek was leaning against the counter, drinking his own cup of coffee while his wife dried the dishes for Penny. He looked up and said a soft, Hey, Shadow. The others turned to me then. They each got up and gave me a warm hug, whispering quiet statements of relief at my arrival. I looked around the room, but I didn't see my father anywhere. Is she? Again, I stumbled on the question. I couldn't say those words. I couldn't think about them. She's still here, Mike said. Dad and Ronald are upstairs with her. Go on up. I met Dad on his way down. He pulled me into his arms and let me have a good cry before leading the way up to the bedroom. He said it would be better if I could get the tears out first, for Mom's sake. He must have been right about the tears. When the door opened, I saw my mother's frail, shrunken frame in the bed, and I doubt I would have been able to hold up if I hadn't got some of the emotion out of me first. 
Ronald, another brother, stood up and motioned for me to take his chair, but I lifted my hand in a refusal gesture, and I climbed tenderly into the bed next to her. Both my father and my brother made to deny me that right, but one look from me told them there was no point in arguing. Hey, Mom, I whispered into her ear. Watery blue eyes opened in a face creased with age. Dark purple patches stained the wells beneath them. Her cheeks, once full and painted in delicate shades of pink, sank inward now in ashen tones, and she broke into a smile. Hello, my baby, she answered in a voice so weak it was barely audible. I wanted to feel my mother's arms around me at that moment more than I wanted to breathe, but I knew it couldn't be. I didn't dare to so much as brush against her. She was too delicate and too brittle and too close to death. All I had was her presence, and I knew I wouldn't have that for long. I watched in her silence for a few minutes before she spoke again. I know, Shadow, she said repeating the words she'd spoken to me earlier in the day. I wonder if she did know, if she ever could know how much I missed her already. Then she turned and stared deep into my eyes, and with more force and deliberation than I thought she could have mustered, she said, I know. I spent the rest of the night taking my turn with the rest of my family at Mom's bedside. For the most part, she slept, and once she opened her eyes and lifted a finger as if to point at her dresser, and I looked over at it, but I had no idea what she was asking for. Another time, she opened her eyes and looked as if she might say something, but she didn't. I couldn't say if her last words were, I know. As far as I was concerned, they were. But I wasn't always in the room. None of us spoke about our time with her, choosing instead to guard those moments within ourselves. At first, we'd leave the bedroom and wander downstairs for another cup of coffee or a can of soda, and each successive visit became more and more wearing until we finally began to pick spots along the hallway where we'd collapse into private reflection until we were called to go sit with her again. We visited her in groups of two, and three, except for Dad. And sometime in the night, we all reached the unspoken agreement that his time with her should be his own. I found myself staring at the tall window outside their door that marked the end of the hall. It looked out over the front of the house and down into the barnyard. And from the floor, all I could see was the black velvet mat glistening with stars until the sun began to rise. Little by little, it brightened into a deep blue separated from the earth below it by long fingers of pink and gold. How could something be so beautiful when the whole world is ending, I asked myself. At that moment, the bedroom door opened and my father stepped out. She's gone, he said. His eyes were red and I detected a slight tremor in his voice, but he was otherwise stoic. Mom would have been proud. Funerals are for the living. I don't know who said that. I can only heartily agree. They make those first few days before the reality of loss sinks in and the senses are dulled and go by so much faster. My mother was no longer with us. What did she care now if her mouth stretched unnaturally wide across her face or if the mortician overdid the makeup. It was her children who stood at the casket and wished they'd done a better job. The funeral was much the same as my grandfather's or anyone else's funeral I'd ever been to. A hundred faces passed before me. Platitudes were served in abundance and answered with copious amounts of gratitude. Hands were shaken and stories were shared and people laughed and people cried. One second, I was staring into my father's stricken face as he announced that my mother had ceased to exist, and the next someone was pushing a plate of food into my hands and telling me what a nice service it was. 
The dinner was held at the church, but our family all congregated at the house afterward. Seven children, all but one of whom had married and produced their own offspring, and who were now counting grandchildren, meant that the house was overflowing with people. I was surprised to realize that more than half of my relatives came from out of town. Eighteen years earlier, when I had fled Willard Springs, it was a novelty, and now it seemed that most of my nieces and nephews lived elsewhere. How are you holding out? I hadn't heard my father slip up beside me. I'd been too busy staring around the room trying to figure out who belonged to who. Okay, I guess, I answered with a sigh. I could have mentioned that it would be nice to find a place to sit, but there would have been no point. How are you doing? He grunted his answer. How long are you staying? He asked. I don't know, Dad. A few more days, I guess. Dr. Witherspoon said to take as much time as I need, but I think it would be better to get back to my students before the adjunct makes too much of a mess of my lesson plans. Stay to the weekend anyway. It was offered as a suggestion, but it felt more like a plea. What are you going to do now, Dad? You don't farm anymore. There's no reason to stay in this big old house. I thought about moving into your granddaddy's house. No one's lived there in years. He glanced down at my horrified expression and put his arm around my shoulder. Don't worry. It was just a thought. It should tear the place down, really. He mulled over that thought for a minute, and then he said, None of this younger generation is interested in farming. Derek and Ben are the only ones, and Mike doesn't do much anymore. He and Penny like to travel. Derek runs his operation. and Ben handles Ronald's, and Matt's still active, but it's only because his boys don't farm. And again, there was a pause. We had an offer on the dairy, and I think I'm going to take it. I knew our little regional operation was struggling under the onslaught of modernization, but the thought of never seeing a gallon of Parker O'Connor milk in the store again left a hole in my chest. I had to remind myself that St. Louis is beyond the reach of Parker O'Connor and that I had therefore not seen a gallon of that milk in decades. Maybe you could come to St. Louis and stay with me for a while, I suggested hopefully. No, Shadow, I can't do that, he said solemnly. If I could have closed my ears to his next statement, I would have. It wouldn't have done any good, though. I knew what he was going to say. Someone has to stay here and keep the woods. It's hot in here, was the best response I could offer. I walked away from him then. It wasn't hot inside. It had, in fact, cooled considerably over the last several hours, which made the house a cozy retreat from the impending bad weather. I had a vague memory of the weatherman predicting frost. It meant that no one was on the porch when I stepped outside and finally found a seat in the swing. But much to my chagrin, Dad followed me, as did Derek. I don't see why you have to keep the woods, I stated angrily to my father. Because there are things out there that can hurt people, Dad argued. Don't worry, Shadow, he has me, Derek offered. You don't need to be involved in this either, I spat at him. Tears were welling up in my eyes as the same cold fear that I'd felt when I saw the dogman attack Scout washed over me. Aunt Shadow! I looked down at a little girl in a pink dress with a white cardigan who had suddenly materialized in front of me. I had no idea whose child she was. Despite the dozens of senior pictures that my mother had sent me over the years and that I'd tucked faithfully into an album on my bookshelf, and despite the hundreds of family photos she'd brought to St. Louis with her on the many visits, depicting images of laughing children and loving parents, I have never been able to separate one from the other. Parker genes are strong. We all have my father's dark eyes and his short square nose with the slightly flaring nostrils. We all have the obstinate clefted chin and his full lower lip. We all have chestnut curls and ears that stick out a little too much. We're not the most handsome family, but no one would call us ugly. 
no more than anyone could deny a Parker when they see one, and the little girl in front of me was a perfect specimen of Parker Jean's in action. What, sweetheart? I asked, ashamed that I didn't know her name. Please don't cry, she said as she climbed into the swing and wedged herself between me and my father. Once she was comfortable, she put her hand in mine and she smiled at me. I guessed her to be around six. Why do they call you Shadow? she asked. Well, I guess it's because I followed my grandfather around when I was your age like his shadow, I told her. Her hand was warm in mine. It's moments like that when I miss never having had children of my own. I think I would have been a good mother. Is he your grandfather? She asked, pointing at my father. And then ignoring my father's frustrated huff, she added, Mine is Mike. I looked up at Derek then, realizing that this could be his daughter. No, sweetheart, he's my daddy. My grandfather was Granddaddy O'Connor. He's not a father, she said indignantly. He's a grandfather. We laughed at her logic. He's my grandfather, Derek told her, but Grandpa Great is Aunt Shadow's daddy, just like he's Grandpa Mike's daddy, and I'm your daddy. How come he isn't your daddy, she asked. Well, if Grandpa Great is your daddy, then Grandpa Mike couldn't be your grandpa, I tried to explain. Well, why not? We all looked at each other, knowing that this conversation was going to take a while. Why don't you go play and I'll explain it later, Derek said. But Daddy, go on, Kenzie, he said. She slid off the swing and crossed her arms, and with her head down and her lower lip out, she stomped away. She has the Parker personality, I laughed. The shadow Parker personality, Dad and Derek said simultaneously. I gave them both an exasperated look. I was still watching Kenzie as she approached her cousins in the yard when Derek said, Grandpa's teaching me everything I need to know about the woods. I closed my eyes. And when he's gone, I'll be here to watch over things. And when you're gone, I asked. Ha, I'm never leaving, he laughed. But at the sight of my angry face, he added, Well, I should be around for another 50 years or so anyway. I couldn't argue with that. My father was sitting beside me well into his 80s, and he didn't look a day over 60. My brother Mike looked older than him. He was still spry and active, and I was sure still driving down the river every day to look for signs. I felt a chill run up my spine at the memory of the last walk I took with him. It would help if you sent us your binder, Dad said gently, at least a copy of it. I made a mental note to finally purchase a home computer. I needed to digitize everything anyway. If I bought a printer, too, I could make the copies at home and send the whole thing off and then take my time entering everything into the computer. I wasn't about to take it into work and have the department work study printed off for me. I was an expert in mythological studies, but that didn't mean I was supposed to believe in them. And then realizing how easily I had accepted their plans, I said, you wouldn't need that binder if you'd just stay away from the woods. Shadow, my dad groaned. I knew I sounded ridiculous, but I was afraid. I was afraid that my father was going to wander out there and run into the same thing Derek had. But this time, there would be no other beast to steal a turkey and inadvertently rescue my father. I couldn't lose another parent. Not yet. I turned my attention back to the children playing in the yard. They were in the midst of a serious game of tag. I was thinking how wonderful it was to see children play. Even as early as 2001, that was becoming a rare sight. All of their Parker faces were flushed and glowing, and most of them were still in their dress clothes from the funeral, but they were all in disarray. I noticed torn and grass-stained pants and rumpled tops and ad-scuffed shoes. Once neatly plaited hair was coming loose and there were more than a few ribbons and neckties lying on the ground around them. And I glanced around and I looked for Kenzie. There were several girls in pink dresses, but I didn't see her among them. I wondered if she had gone inside. 
I need a drink, I said, standing up. You guys want anything? I'll take a cup of coffee, Dad said. Derek shook his head no. Inside, the house was a maze of people, but I managed to make my way to the kitchen where I made myself a glass of root beer and poured a cup of coffee for Dad. Penny was standing at the sink doing dishes as quickly as they were being returned and still not managing to keep up. Jessie, Derek's wife, was on the drying detail. Have you seen Derek? Jessie asked as I filled my glass with ice. He's outside talking with me and Dad, I told her. Can you ask him to find Kenzie? I don't want her playing with the other kids until she's changed out of her dress. Well, I think she's inside somewhere, I said. She was on the porch with me, and I wasn't sure I wanted to tell her that she'd been playing with the other kids already, but there was no point in lying. And then she went out to play in the yard. But I didn't see her before I came in, so I think she came back inside. Oh, okay, Jessie said with a sigh. I'll find her. She put down her towel and headed down the hall in search of her daughter. And I took the coffee and the soda outside. Hey, if you see your daughter, let her know her mother wants her, I told Derek. Typical of a man, he nodded and then immediately dismissed the request. Look, if we had that binder here with all the information you have in it, he began. That binder isn't static, you know, I interrupted. I add to it and update it constantly. Well, I realized that, but if we had it here, a copy anyway, it would be a great reference. You have Granddaddy's journal, so all we have are the notes Grandpa made since he died. I rolled my eyes and grunted my displeasure. There was no point arguing with them. At least if they had the binder, Derek would have more knowledge. Dad wouldn't need it. Much of the information in that binder came from him. I looked at Dad then, and I recognized his age. Time is relentless. It never slows, it never stops, and it never waits. The future is a blind alley. Who knows what lies beyond the next minute? And When my parents came down for a visit earlier that year, my mother was as healthy and active as ever. A few months later, Dad called to tell me that she had had a heart attack, and today we buried her. I'll send it, I conceded. There was no point in arguing. The screen door swung open. Jessie came outside. Derek, have you seen Kenzie? she asked. We all turned to look at the children playing in the yard. I thought she went inside, I reasserted. She isn't there. I looked all over. Jessie's voice denoted worry. Well, she's around here somewhere, Derek told her. But even as she said the words, we were all moving off the porch and into the yard. Hey, Derek yelled to the kids. Has anyone seen Kenzie? A boy of about 13 said, she went off that way, pointing toward the barn. None of us spoke as we all headed to the barn, but we were all beginning to worry. Dad muttered something about history repeating itself. I was reminded that I, too, had wandered off to the barn when I was young. I held on to the prospect of another positive outcome. At the barn, Dad slid open the wide door and he called her name. I walked around the far end and started into the pasture, and beyond it were the woods. Derek turned and looked over toward Granddaddy's house in the woods behind it. Jesse, go inside and check the house thoroughly. Derek told his wife. Now make sure you check every room, even the attic. Jesse turned and ran back to the house. And have everyone help you, he called after her. Dad, I whispered softly, you don't think... He looked at me hard, willing me not to finish the sentence. Derek, who had finished the sentence in his own mind, sprang into action. Can I use the ATV, he asked. Keys on the hook in the barn, Dad answered. And then he said, I'll go with you. No. It was my voice I heard, but I couldn't believe it was me speaking. You stay here and make sure no one else goes into those woods alone. I'll go with Derek. I was pretty sure I had lost my mind. Nothing short of rescuing Derek's daughter would have ever driven me back into those woods. 
No, Shadow, he began. Don't argue with me, Dad. I'm younger and more agile than you. I doubted that, but it sounded like a good argument. I marched off to the barn, and I hopped onto the back of the ATV. Derek guided us recklessly down the tractor path that separated the pastures from the hay fields. As he maneuvered across the ruts and around the corners, I kept my eyes open for signs of a little pink dress and a white cardigan. At the wood line, he turned and slowed down considerably, searching along the undergrowth. We traced the edge of the woods all the way to the gravel road that split the property in half. And on the other side, we drove slowly along the trees until we got to the river. We both called her name repeatedly, and we listened for an answer, but the constant putter of the ATV's engine drowned out most sounds. At the river, Derek turned off the ATV. We're going to have to walk, he said. I was suddenly aware that neither of us had a gun. But what if, what if my daughter's out there, he cut me off. He was right. Guns or no guns, we needed to find Kinsey. It was late afternoon. We didn't have much daylight left. I looked down at my feeble shoes and was suddenly glad that my little black dress had been in the dry cleaners. It meant that I had to bring dress pants and penny loafers. Otherwise, I'd have been standing there in kitten heels. The sound of two more ATVs buzzing down the road had us turning to see my dad and Mike coming toward us. They pulled up and climbed off their vehicles, and Dad gave Derek a rifle and handed me a 9mm Glock. I took it and stared helplessly. We've got everyone else looking around the house and the yard, Dad said, as he and Mike checked over their own weapons. If they find her, they're to fire three shots. And then he looked at me. Do you think you can handle this thing, he said. I hadn't fired a gun in years. Now, I respect the rights of others to own guns, but I'm not a gun owner. I've watched all the movies and I've had all the daydreams where I take a pistol in hand and lock and load and tie a scarf around my forehead and dip my fingers into the mud and run them across my cheeks and say something cool like, let's roll. That isn't how this played out. I stood there trembling until my father took back the gun and told me to stay close to him. It wouldn't have taken down the things that live in these woods anyway. Three shocked faces turned to stare at Mike. He blinked at us as if he assumed that we knew what he knew. And then he said, You can't be serious. Everyone knows evil lives here. Damn it, Mike got the cool line. Shadow and I are going to head this way, Dad said, choosing not to waste time discussing the things that Mike did or didn't know. You two head down along the riverbank till you get to the rock path, and then circle back toward the farmhouse and cover the woods behind it. And keep your eyes on the pastures. We'll meet you on the other side. I was quickly beginning to realize how utterly useless I was. Mike and Derek headed down the bank while Dad and I headed into the woods. Ten feet in, it already felt like night. The dense trees overhead were like weights pressing down on us. Every step was a cracking twig or a crunching leaf, and I felt eyes on us. Whether they were predatory or squirrels, I couldn't say. Fear and anxiety were playing havoc with my senses. We should have brought flashlights, I whispered. Shh, was Dad's response. He had stopped walking and held up his hand. I stood silently beside him and I listened for whatever he was hearing. It was a moment before the reality set in and I heard nothing. Dad looked at me and raised his eyebrows as if to say, Well, we've come this far, and he began walking again. I stayed close to him, remembering that day a dozen years ago when I thought he was behind me, but he wasn't. That wasn't going to happen again. The undergrowth of woods was varied. Patches of low-growing plants popped out of the leaf matter in places. Empty limbs lay scattered around in varying stages of decay. Bunchberries with their red fruit gathered at the base of trees moss-covered rocks angled outward as we climbed the terrain upwards away from the river. 
We stopped and stared at a pair of saplings that were snapped in two, eight feet off the ground and bent together to form a perfect X. I looked at Dad and he nodded. Are they still here? I asked as quietly as I could. He pointed to another X formation that had been knocked down. When the Sasquatch leave, he whispered, the dog men come and push over their markers. We continued. My feet were beginning to hurt inside my shoes. Night was approaching, bringing with it a chill that was settling in my bones. I remembered again the overly jolly weatherman saying something about a frost. Was Kenzie cold? Was she alive? Dad, I finally said, we can't continue to be this quiet. How's Kenzie going to know we're out here looking for her? Well, it's better than them knowing she's out there waiting for us, he answered, and we moved on. When we crossed the gravel road, we looked at the setting sun in dismay. Time was running out. I don't know how long we'd been walking, but I guessed it'd taken an hour to get to where we were. My feet were crying and my muscles were aching, and I made a mental note to get a gym membership when I got home, if I got home. The woods on this side were much the same as the other. Crosses and rock piles, many of which had been desecrated, and warned us that we were not alone, that we were not the apex predators. Dread pushed me closer to my father. Something snapped behind us, and Dad swung around, rifle raised. I mimicked his motion, but I didn't see anything. Following the barrel of the gun, I squinted to see what was making my father draw in his breath, and a pair of eyes glowed malevolently fifty yards from us. Instinctively, I turned and put my back to my father, scanning the opposite direction for signs of being surrounded. There was another pair of eyes at my three o'clock, and I nudged Dad with my elbow and pointed. Dogmen? I asked. Amber eyes, he whispered. I don't think so. His body pushed against mine as he began to back through the woods, and slowly I moved forward acting as our eyes so that we didn't fall over any logs. And then there was that howl. It was louder than anything I ever remembered hearing, louder even than the howls that woke me all those years ago in my grandfather's house. It shook my breastbone and threatened to burst my heart. Dad turned then and began to move quickly through the undergrowth. I almost had to break into a run to keep up with him. We were heading directly back to the house now. Was he giving up? Was my father as big a coward as me? And then he made a sharp turn to his right and he walked along the ridge line. The drop-off was no more than 20 feet, but the rocks and brambles and dead trees made the thought of falling into the gully a miserable prospect. I had no idea where he was leading us. I could only follow Dad was used to wandering these woods. He was wearing hiking boots. He changed into his denims and flannels as soon as we got back from the funeral. In my white dress shirt and purple mole hair cardigan and penny loafer shoes, I was no match for him. All around us, I heard heavy breathing and low growls, but we pressed forward. And then it happened. One minute, I was behind my father doing my best to keep up with him, and the next, I was tumbling over the edge. I'd gotten too close and stepped wrong and turned my ankle and lost my balance. And thorns gouged at my clothing and tore at my skin while rocks and dead branches pummeled my body. It was part barrel roll and part free fall as I bounced off the outcroppings and exposed roots. There was no way to stop myself. Shadow, I heard my father's voice call from the top of the hill. I hoped that he wouldn't fall as well when I heard his footsteps crashing through the brush looking for a path down to where I was. I rolled to a breathless stop a foot from a downed tree. Moss covered and rotting, it must have been lying there for ages. The bend of the trunk created an arch barely big enough to crawl under, and I stared into the space, aching with the need to recapture the wind that had been knocked out of me. 
and a pair of dark, frightened eyes stared back. Kenzie, I said. She answered by placing her finger on her lips and then pointing upward. There was a moment of understanding then, and I knew what I would see when I looked up. My blood froze in my veins. My mind screamed not to look, but my eyes wouldn't listen. Standing ten yards away on the other side of the fallen tree, staring over at me, was the largest creature I have ever seen in my life. It must have been eight feet tall, but I was on the ground looking up. From that position, it looked much taller. Amber eyes pierced me as it opened its mouth to bear its canines at me. They were as long as my index finger, if not longer. It didn't have ears, not that I could see, but it did have a snout. I knew instantly what I was looking at. My nephew told me once that he knew he was going to die because all hope drained from his body. And until that moment, I couldn't fully understand what he had meant. Now, however, I was going to die. I knew there would be nothing to prevent that. Perhaps it's where I drew the courage to think. I would die, but maybe my death would allow Kinsey to live. Kinsey, I said without taking my eyes off the beast. How could I explain what I had to say? It took a step toward me, and I glanced up reflectively, and I warned her. It's coming this way, and when it gets here, she whimpered. Baby, listen, when it gets here and it grabs me, I glanced at her now, making sure that she was paying attention. You need to run. You saw where I fell from, right? She nodded her head. You need to get there. Great Grandpa is up there and he'll take you home. The creature was moving ever closer. I laid as still as I could. And no matter how desperately I wanted to run, I knew I had to lie still and let it take me, or Kinsey would not live. It leaned over the tree and sniffed deeply of my scent. I don't know if they have the ability to smile or what a smile would mean if they did, but that's what it looked like this thing was doing. Something in my scent was pleasing to it. In the nanoseconds it had taken me to fall, and to hear my father charging after me, and to recognize my grandniece, and to acknowledge the beast and to accept my death, my mind raced. I was sitting in the lounge at the college eaves, dropping on a conversation between two of my colleagues from the science department. They were discussing pheromones and fear. Someone had written a paper on predators playing with their prey. It had something to do with making the meat taste better. Was this monster trying to scare me into being a better meal? Even as I began to stand up, the sound of gunfire erupted from my left. My father was firing his gun. No! I screamed. It would go after my dad. I couldn't lose both parents in the same week. They were all I had. I got to my feet and faced my opponent. And it leaned down at me, mouth gaping, and hissed its fetid breath in my face. Long claws raked the top of my head as it grabbed a handful of my hair and lifted me off the ground. I grabbed its arm and held on with both hands as I mentally willed Kenzie to run. As I dangled there, three more gunshots split the air. It pulled me close, and it opened its mouth wide. I could have counted the teeth if I'd had time. I kicked at it with my feet, hitting it in the chest and stomach. And suddenly, from somewhere behind the monster, another round of rifle fire exploded. Voices were screaming, and Dad fired several more rounds. I felt myself being flung away like an unwanted toy, and my ribs cracked against the tree and my wrists snapped, but I was conscious. Kenzie was what mattered now. The monster was turned around and staring up the hillside at the two men who were firing down on it. Bullets were hitting it, but none of them seemed to penetrate. And then one struck its neck, and blood spurted in a long arc across the little holler. I ran then. I had to get to Kenzie. A bellowing roar like a shockwave washed over me, 
and nearly brought me to my knees, but there was no time to look back, no time to assess the situation. I kept running. I was reminded of Derek's story. Something had tried to steal its meal. It had turned and fought, presumably to the death, for the right to the turkey. My nephew would certainly have provided more meat than the bird had, but this thing was territorial. Owning what it earned was more important to it than allowing something else to encroach on it. Would it view me the same way? Was it following me to retain ownership, or was it fighting off the interlopers? I reached my father almost as soon as Kenzie did. We didn't need to speak. I knew he was going to stay there and fight it off if it came our way. My job now was to get my grandniece to safety. A scream like nothing I'd ever heard before echoed through the woods as more gunfire pelted the behemoth. Kenzie stopped. She tried to turn around and look back, but I wouldn't let her. And fire shot up my leg with every step. My wrist ached and breathing hurt and my head hurt, but none of that mattered. This was my reason for existence. My parents had me so late in life that I could be here on this day to keep Kenzie safe, to keep her from seeing the carnage behind us. Another scream assaulted us. This time it belonged to a man. I didn't have to turn and look to know what was happening. He was being torn to pieces. Tormented cries mixed with sounds of bones being crunched and bullets being fired. My knees faltered and I found myself falling face forward to the ground. There were three men behind me, my father, my brother, and my nephew, and I loved them all. There was no hoping it wouldn't be this one or that. At that moment, I knew there'd be another funeral soon. Daddy, Kenzie cried. I will never forget the expression on that poor child's face when I looked up at her. In an instant, all innocence was gone and her childhood was lost forever because, dear God forgive me, I had let her turn around. More gunshots rang out. The beast was screaming again, but this time I heard real pain coming from it and I was glad. I wanted it to die. I wanted it to perish slowly and with as much agony as my father and brother could put on it. I managed to get up onto my knees, but it was as far as I was going. Every breath was stabbing pain in my side, my ankle was swelling rapidly, and bruises were forming everywhere. All I could do was turn around and watch, and Kenzie climbed into my lap and I held her face to my chest while she cried. I couldn't let her see what I was seeing. Derek's body was draped over the log Kenzie had hidden under. Mike was advancing on the beast, emptying his gun into it with every step. Dad was moving down the hill toward it, ready to take his turn. He couldn't fire yet. Mike was too close, but he knew it would only be a few more steps before he too would open fire and accept his fate. The monster stood and roared its fury at the sky, enraged by the pitiful man-creature whose bullets had somehow managed to penetrate and spill its blood. Our greatest moments, our saddest moments, our worst moments, why do we always remember them in slow motion? What could not have lasted more than 30 seconds felt like hours. Mike moved ever closer to the beast, and Dad closed in as well. And the beast erupted with one last mighty roar, and it fell. The longest moment I remember came when my father and brother approached Derek. From my perch on the hillside, I saw Dad's hand reach down and feel for a pulse. Mike stood frozen in place, waiting and praying for an answer he knew he wouldn't get. And Dad dropped his head, and the two men cried. I felt my own tears begging for release, but something inside me refused to set them free. My memory beyond that point is vague at best. I remember Kenzie and I being helped onto the back of an ATV, but where it came from or who was driving it, I couldn't say. Derek's body was brought back to the house, but again, I have no idea how or by who. Someone called 911. 
Kenzie and I were taken to the emergency room via ambulance. Jesse rode with us. I was grateful when the EMT told her to stop asking me questions. He said my ribs were probably broken and talking was painful. He was right. Speaking was agony. More so because I had no idea what to tell her than from the physical pain it caused. She deserved answers. Her husband was dead. Her youngest child was in shock. The medical bills I received tell me that I was in the hospital for two days. I had multiple injuries that included cracked ribs, a broken wrist, an ankle, multiple contusions, and a mild concussion. In the end, they bandaged me and gave me a prescription for the pain and sent me on my way. I was too heavily medicated to attend Derek's funeral. I wasn't there when Kenzie told her story. I got it secondhand from my father. She said that she was mad because she wanted to sit with Aunt Shadow, but her dad made her go play with the other kids. When the other kids wouldn't play with her, she decided to go out to the barn to see if there were any new kittens to play with. And while she was searching, she heard a whistle. It came from behind the barn, so she went out there to investigate. That was when she saw what she thought was a big dog that she followed across the pasture and into the woods. It wasn't until the dog stood up on two legs that she realized her mistake. Children have no real relationship with time. They haven't had to answer to it yet, not the way that we adults do. She didn't know how long she was out there or the exact order in which the events occurred. She only remembered being afraid and knowing that she had to hide. She was in her third hiding place when I fell down the ridge and I found her. The police had come that night. They were taken down into the hollow where Derek was killed, but the body of the beast was gone. They suggested it must have been a large feral dog. After all, Kenzie had described it as such. My father chose not to argue. Mike would have objected, but Dad put his hand up to silence him, and that was enough. Despite all my grandfather's safeguards, my entire family was aware, had always been aware, that something wasn't right in the woods. Matt was the first to admit it. He talked about the night Juliana had died. He had always stubbornly declared that he had seen nothing, but that wasn't true. What he saw when he went into the woods looking for her was more than he could describe, and he had to run from the scene. And like me, he berated himself for his cowardice. If he'd been brave, maybe Juliana could have been rescued. My father assured him that he couldn't have saved Juliana any more than he and Mike could have kept Derek alive. It was little comfort to Matt, but it allowed my other siblings to open up and tell their own stories. None were as horrifying as Matt's, but all were enough to make believers of everyone. My father, at least, was happy to think that my mother had never known, nor had to worry about the well-being of her children in that respect. That theory was disproven when my sister Jenny brought my breakfast up to my room a few days after Derek's funeral. I was sitting in a chair by the east window. I had been allowed to come home from the hospital only on the condition that I not walk up and down the stairs, so I was essentially trapped in my room. Being able to sit at the window and soak in the sunlight was a little compensation for my incarceration, Jenny put the tray of food on the table beside me and she helped me adjust my seat so I could transfer it to my lap. And then she sat down and asked how I was feeling. And she checked my temperature and fussed over me in her big sisterly way. I in turn picked at the plate of fried eggs and bacon and toast and took a few sips of orange juice before giving up and settling for hot coffee with a splash of cream, just like Granddaddy used to drink it. I have something for you, she said, after tucking one of her mother's crocheted blankets around my shoulders. She reached into a pocket of her apron and pulled out an envelope. Kate and I found it in Mom's jewelry box yesterday, and she handed it to me, 
and written on it in Mom's precise handwriting was my name. I looked up at Jenny questioningly, and she shrugged and said, I guess you'd better open it. It was a letter that read, Shadow, when you decided to move so far away at such a young age, I won't deny that I was both hurt and worried for you. I couldn't understand why you would make such a decision. Your father will tell you, if he'll admit to it, that I did a lot of crying those first couple of years. I'd hoped that one day you would decide to come home. And when your granddaddy died, I was sure that you would. I wouldn't let anyone else move into his house because I believed that one day you would come back and move into it yourself. All these years, I've kept it up for you, waiting and hoping. I also wondered if the day would come when you would regret not being here. I saw the sorrow you felt for not being with your granddaddy when he died, and I worried that you might someday feel the same guilt for not being here for me and your father. And then last spring, while I was putting in my garden, I began to feel as though someone was watching me. I looked around, but I couldn't see anyone, so I attributed it to an overactive imagination. A few days later, it happened again, and a few days after that, and a few days after that. Something had happened to Derek in the woods a couple of weeks before that. He wouldn't say what or even admit that anything did happen, but I saw the change in him. A grandmother always knows. Yesterday it all began to make sense. I was standing at the kitchen sink, snapping beans and getting them ready to can when I happened to look out at my garden. You can't imagine what I saw. Or maybe you can. I don't know if that's the reason you left, but after your granddaddy's funeral, I'm sure that's what has kept you away. And I want you to know, Shadow, that I know. I understand. In fact, I'm glad. These woods are not safe. Love, Mom. I looked up at Jenny in shock. She took the letter and read it herself. We agreed not to tell our father that our mother had been aware of the monsters in our woods. He had taken too much comfort in thinking that she'd never known. I was reminded of the night when Mom died. She pointed toward her dresser once. That's where her jewelry box sat. She was telling me then that the letter was there. I tucked the letter into my pocket of my robe. Three weeks after that, I was packing my bag to leave when Kenzie came into my room. By then, all of her scratches and bruises had mended. I, on the other hand, still bore quite a few yellow and purple marks on my body. My right hand was in a cast and my left leg was in a boot. There was little to do for my ribs except to ice them periodically and I had long since quit doing that. I'd been warned to stay in bed and not drive until I was fully mended. I don't know if that was due to the headaches I was still having from the concussion or if driving would somehow mean my bones would take longer to heal, but I wanted to go home. Kenzie climbed up on the bed and watched me quietly for several minutes. I smiled at her and I asked how she was doing. Fine, she said. Daddy says you're leaving today. Yes, I answered. I have to get back to my job. You're a profess... Pro, you're a prof... She was struggling with the word. I'm an associate professor, I said for her. Yeah, that's what Daddy said, she agreed. Why can't you profess here? I looked at her then. Her dark eyes were full of pain that her young life should never have experienced. Well, there aren't any schools around here for me to profess at, I answered honestly. Daddy said you'd say that, but he said I should say thank you anyway. It hadn't struck me immediately, but when it did, it was like a lightning bolt of realization that shot through me. I stopped packing clothes and I stared at the wall for a minute, trying to make sense of her use of the word daddy. Why was she speaking of her father in the present tense? For the briefest moment, I thought maybe Derek was still alive, 
that I had imagined or maybe dreamt all of this. But I knew better. I'd seen his body. I had a cast on my wrist and a boot on my leg to remind me. Derek was dead. You mean your grandfather, don't you? I suggested, thinking that perhaps she had subconsciously substituted Mike as her father figure. No, Daddy, she insisted. He also said that I should give you this message. She cocked her head and screwed up her face as she mentally went over the words before saying them. He said he'll keep the woods now. Now what does that mean, Aunt Shadow? Driving back to St. Louis, I heard Kenzie's little voice say over and over again, he'll keep the woods now. It came at such a shock that I was at a loss for words to answer her. I had to stop the sudden flow of tears before I could even find my voice to do so. In the end, I told her that he was going to watch over the woods and keep us all safe from the monsters from now on. It was the best answer I could give, and I suppose it was the truth. Dad drove down to St. Louis the following spring to spend a week with me. He'd aged drastically in the months since Mom died. I suspected that it would be the last time I saw him. And with Derek gone, there was no reason to give him the binder. He suggested that I turn it into a book. I didn't have the heart to tell him that I was already working on that. I took him to breakfast at my favorite little cafe down the road to celebrate the sale of the dairy business. We took in a Cardinals game, and we watched The Legend of Boggy Creek on DVD, and we laughed at the end when Bobby Ford was attacked in the yard. The attack itself wasn't funny, but if you stop the video at the right moment, you can see through the eye holes of the monster's mask to the face of the man in the costume. Dad told me that he hadn't seen any activity of any sort since the previous fall. What didn't surprise me, Derek was always a man of his word. When it was time for him to go, he hugged me. I didn't want to let go. We must have stood there for a good 15 minutes hugging and crying. On July 27, 2002, exactly 48 years after my grandfather made his first journal entry, my father died peacefully in his sleep. For once, the funeral was uneventful.